around the world. The Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. David Langford here. We'd like to take the opportunity, as always, to welcome each and every one of you to the telecast. It is my desire, it is my prayer that the telecast is a blessing to everyone watching. I try to come here each week and share with you an uncompromising message from the Word of the Lord. Sadly, there is so much compromise today, people really don't understand any longer the Word of God, the plan of God, and the will of God, not only for our personal lives, but for our nation. Sadly, many are departing from the truth and they're turning to fables, they're turning to heresy, they're turning to fallacy, things that are not true, neither genuine. But I assure you today, by the living God of Abraham, God's word is true, God's word is holy, and God's word is pure. And Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. That shows you the eternity of God's word, it will never, ever, ever change. And that's a prophecy. When Jesus said heaven and earth will pass away, that is a prophetic utterance. How do we know? Revelation 21, 1, John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. After the thousand year millennial reign of Christ, God will create a new heaven and a new earth, and it will be filled with nothing but eternal righteousness. Then, New Jerusalem can then descend out of heaven from God as a bride adorned for her husband and sit on this new earth. He's not going to bring a new Jerusalem on an old earth, but it will be a new heaven and a new earth for the new Jerusalem as the word of God has told us, amen. I want to go back to Jeremiah chapter 2. We've been teaching for quite some time. We're going to exegete this whole second chapter of Jeremiah. And we've been using for a thought, a subject matter. Has America become a harlot nation, a prostitute? Sadly, I must report to you, America and the modern church is prostituting their relationship with God. God is holy. God is pure. God is just. God is undefiled. And it's high time the church get back to the cross, get back to the altar, restore the mourner's bench where people will come to the altar and pray and hot tears will stream down their faces because of the power and the presence of the living God. I assure you, when the Holy Ghost of God shows up in a church, everyone is going to recognize it and know there is a difference. Amen. Oh, I know I get criticized because I'm old school, but God has not changed. And I'm so glad I was born in a generation that still knew the manifestation and the moving of God's Holy Spirit. There are people today who have never seen a manifestation of the Holy Ghost of God in their churches. I got a letter some months back. A dear sister, I think she was in Kansas, Oklahoma. I don't remember the state exactly. But she was a little girl in the 40s and a United Methodist Church. And she talked about how the preacher would preach, and the choir would sing, and the Spirit of God would envelop that sanctuary. And they had the windows raised, and people were standing outside the church, viewing in through the open windows, and being touched by the power, and being touched by the Spirit of God. I long for that, and I believe with all of my heart, we will see that again. If we will pray 
and seek God, we will see a move of God again because God said he would pour out of his spirit upon all flesh. And I believe that. But we're going to have to repent and get right with God for there to be that august manifestation of the spirit of the Lord. I want to go back to Jeremiah chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verse 12. Verse 12. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. That doesn't sound like a whole lot. Some may say it doesn't say anything to them. It doesn't speak to their heart. But let me tell you what Elohim is saying there. He said the heavens are going to be trembling they're going to be afraid because they, the heavens, are considering the doom and the judgment that God would soon bring upon Israel because of their sins. I believe nature right now, I believe nature right now is well aware of the impending judgment of God on this nation. You know, months ago I I did a series of programs on the year 2023. And I admonished people to get ready for tornadic weather. And it seemed like the next week or the week following, some of the most devastating tornadoes came across this nation. Creation is groaning. Creation is travailing. Why? Because of sin and iniquity. Friend, sin is destructive. Sin is is damning. Sin will encroach your life and utterly destroy you if you do not get rid of malignant sin in your life. The word malignancy simply means tends to produce death. Sin is a cancer. And when sin becomes malignant, it will destroy everything about you. And the heavens were astonished because they could see they could discern what was coming to Israel, and for the most part, they were not ready. Israel remained calloused. Israel remained apathetic and complacent concerning the impending judgment of God. We need to be seeking God that we might divert this judgment on this nation. Every week, we hear on the news of the corruptness, the wickedness of our national leaders, crime, criminal events that take place, and they keep living like that. They keep doing things. They keep going a particular way, which is destroying the very fabric of this nation. Sometimes I would to God, we could come together and, and put a stop, a screeching halt, to this morass of sin and wickedness that is destroying our nation. This is a satanic design. It is satanic chaos. It is a satanic disruption trying to destroy this nation. And Satan is doing all he can to destroy the church of the living God. But like a mighty, mighty, mighty armor, the church are to arise and stand up. And declare, God, if you're for us, who can be against us? And I'm telling you, if the church will get back to prayer and fasting and proclaiming the word of Almighty God, I believe God can move and God can take down the wicked and exalt the righteous. But if we don't pray, if we don't seek God, this will never happen. This is not going to take place by happenstance or by chance. It's going to take place because somebody paid a price to see God move a man. Are you willing to pay a price? Are you willing to get away from the dinner table for two or three days and say, God, I won't eat a bite of food until you move? Oh, I know you hear very little about fasting today. But the Bible says in Matthew 17, 21, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. 
It's going to take prayer. It's going to take fasting. Psalms 35, 13, David said, I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer returned into my bosom. When we fast and pray, that pulls on the garment of God, and he hears our humble plea and our feeble cry, and he will move in our behalf if we'll take the time to sincerely seek his counsel. I thought about this scripture here again, Jeremiah 2 and 12. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. Let me put that in a modern vernacular. Could the heavens, being desolate and devoid of clouds, possibly refer to the vaporization of nuclear bombs? There's talk. You hear it, I hear it. There, there's chatter all over the world about a nuclear war. I heard former President Donald J. Trump say a few weeks ago in an interview, we're getting close to the purposes of a nuclear war. You say that'll never happen. It's already happened. It happened in Japan, Nagasaki, and Hiroshima. And, and, and those bombs that were dropped then in the 40s are like firecrackers today to the megatons that we have relative to nuclear warheads. I know some of you say that'll never happen. It's already happened. You can't deny the truth. The genie has been let out of the bottle. I read just the other day, we have nuclear submarines all around South Korea right now. Is that because of North Korea and because of China? Those far eastern nations, the Philippines, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, they are fearful. They are fearful of what China is doing. And every time God ever judged a nation, he raised up another nation to attack them. When Israel was living as they were here in the book of Jeremiah, God raised up Babylon King Nebuchadnezzar to come in like a lion. Nebuchadnezzar was described as a lion. And he came in and he ravaged all of Jerusalem. Why? Because of sin. Because Israel had forgotten their God Elohim. Israel had worshipped idols. Can you imagine making an idol? You make it yourself and then you turn around and you pay obeisance to it. You worship it, something you made. That means you're the God of that idol. And yet you would worship it. That's what Israel did. They made idols and they worshiped the things that they made. Amen. Verse 13, Jeremiah 2, 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewn them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. What a travesty. What a tragedy. He said, my people have committed two evils. The first one, they had forsaken the fountain of living water, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus cried aloud in John 7, 38, 39, on that last day of the feast. He that believeth in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. He is the fountain of life. Isaiah 12 and 3 says, Therefore with joy shall you draw water from the wells of salvation. God is a fountain of life to everyone. But he said, Israel, you have abandoned me, the fountain of living water. You've abandoned me, the water of life. And you've hewn out cisterns. You've made your own religion. You've made your own worship. You no longer worship me in spirit. You no longer worship me in truth. You've, you've made a religious ideology that you've created yourself by hewning out these cisterns. And you think you have something spiritual. But he said, what you have is nothing. Friend, 
I'm not a religious man. I'm a spiritual man. Religion is one of the most damnable things that has ever been created by mankind. Satan is the author and the finisher of religion. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about a divine, Holy Ghost, Spirit-filled relationship with Jesus Christ. Oh, I love to get down on my knees and talk to God. Every one of us can have an audience with God any time we want to. All we have to do is bow the knee and cry, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And the presence of the Lord will fill your heart and fill your life. we got to get back. We've got to throw away these cisterns, this religiosity that we have created. We've got to cast that to the side and get back in to the presence of God. Listen to the words of Christ to the church at Laodicea and Revelation 3, beginning at verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel thee, I admonish thee, I beseech thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich with white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. It is amazing how we see ourselves and then how God sees us. We all picture ourselves in a certain way. We visualize mentally in our minds how we see ourselves. The word Laodicea in the Greek means the voice of the people is the voice of God. What a lie and what a tragedy. The voice of the people is not the voice of God. That's what we call democracy. God is about theocracy. God is in control. He is the Lord. He's the Redeemer. He's the Savior. He's the one that cleanses us from our sins and from our iniquities. Amen? He. Here's what the Laodicean church said. We're rich. We're increased with goods. And we have need of nothing. But then look how God sees the church. He said, you're wretched, you are miserable, you are poor, you're blind, and you're naked. Some of you watching right now, you are miserable. You are miserable because you have left your first love. You don't love God like you used to love God. You've gotten too busy. You don't pray. You don't read your Bible. Oh, you pay your tithes. You want, the, you want the temporal blessing, but you don't pay the price for the spiritual blessings of God. He says, you're wretched. You're miserable. You're poor. You're blind. And you are naked. You don't have your wedding garment on. Neither are you prepared for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. When I think about being miserable, there's been times in all of our lives because of a circumstance or a situation, we were miserable. Maybe it was a wayward son or a wayward daughter that had become engulfed and drugs and alcohol and promiscuity, been locked up. Maybe some of your children have been put in prison. And yet we say we're rich. We're increased with goods. We have need of nothing. It is because of sin that your child is in prison. Did you hear me? I said it is because of sin. Sin. S-I-N. Sin that has suffered your child to be in prison. That breaks my heart. 
that grieves my spirit to no end. Why? Because I understand the, the damage, the, the ferocity of sin, how it eviscerates, how it scars, how it mutilates, how it destroys everything that it touches. Sin is insane. Do you hear me? Sin is insanity. You say, well, what do you mean by that? The prodigal son. After the father blessed him and he got his inheritance, the Bible said he spent it on riotous living. Let me, let me put that in modern vernacular. He was raising hell. Prostitutes, drugs, alcohol. He was raising hell. And when he got through, he found himself at the hog pen, eating husk just like the swine, just like the pigs were eating. That's where sin will take you. I know people, I have a, a friend, one of the greatest preachers I ever heard preach in my life. And he backslid on God and lost his marriage, his children, everything. And he sang a song when I was pastoring. I had him as an evangelist. He sang a song, I've come too far to turn back now. I've come too far, he said. I have it on video. But you know what? The devil got in the arrangement and he turned back to the hog pen. But that's the great thing about the prodigal son. The Holy Ghost touched his mind because the Bible said when he came to himself, when he came to his senses, he said, what am I doing here? Why am I in this miserable, pathetic place that I'm living? It was because he left the Father. Many today have left the Father. But he said in his heart and to himself, I'm going to go back home. I'm not worthy to be called a son. I'll just ask my Father to make me a hired servant. Folks, that's not the kind of God we serve. We are God's children. He loves us. And when the prodigal son came to his mind and he came to his senses, he started going back home. And the father looked across the plain and he saw his son. He said, my son who I thought was dead is alive. Kill the fatted calf. We're going to rejoice we're going to proclaim my son who I thought was dead is now alive. And the father opened up his arms and he fell on his son and he kissed him on the neck. God never quits loving us, but you can turn and walk away from God. And had that prodigal died out there, he would have died lost. He would have died lost without God. But the Holy Spirit brooded over him. And he came to his senses. Some of you watching me right now, you need to come to your senses. The road you're walking down, the path you're going down, is a path of chaos and a path of destruction. But if you'll turn to the Lord, he will have mercy upon you. He will heal your blinded eyes. He will restore your broken spirit. He will give you life and give it to you more abundantly. I'm going to pray right now for the lost. Father, I humbly come before your majestic throne. I pray for every backslider, every sinner, those who are cold, tepid, lukewarm, and indifferent. I pray for them. Even now, Lord, Holy Ghost, reach out to them. I know you are. You're reaching even now. And bring them to a place of repentance. Sinner friend, just get on your knees and say, God, 
I'm sorry for my sins. I'm sorry for leaving you. I'm sorry for forsaking you. But I'm so happy, Lord, that you still loved me in spite of my transgressions, that you commended your love toward me, that while I was in sin, you still loved me. Let him restore your heart. Let him restore your life. Let him restore your home. Let him restore your marriage. Pray, and he will restore your children if you'll look to him. Now, Father, I commit this telecast, this little short message tonight. I commit it into your hands, and I pray that you will take it and you will use it for your honor, for your praise, and for your glory. I believe what has been said today will not return void, but it will accomplish that which will please you and prosper in the hearing of those who have heard it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. We humbly pray, amen and amen. I encourage you, everyone listening to me right now, make a recommitment, rededicate your life, and find time to pray and get in the Word of God. I implore you, I beseech you with all that is within me, find the time. Make the time, make the time to get into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and let the Holy Ghost of God revive you. Oh, the Holy Ghost is like rivers of living water, like dew to the herbs. It refreshes and it brings life and it brings help and it brings restoration. God bless you. I want you to know we pray for you. No, I don't know you, but God does. And that's all that matters. God knows you. I don't, but he does. And I'm going to keep praying for you that you will walk the walk and talk the talk. The times are, are nearing when uncertainty is going to fill the earth as never before. You need a Savior. You need Jesus Christ to be with you. God bless you. I'll see you next week. Do pray and seek God's counsel. I know he will help you if you will seek his face. Amen. I'll see you next week in the Lord. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502 Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.